Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mike Swetnam, and it's my privilege to uh, welcome you to the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies today. Uh, we have, for a long time here at the Potomac Institute, been privileged to be the host for a series of, of seminars, studies, and in fact publications on a variety of issues surrounding terrorism. The Potomac Institute for Policy Studies is a not-for-profit think tank in the Washington, D.C. area that focuses on the issues of science and technology and how science and technology affect our government and our society, uh, our health, if you will, in the world that we live in. We began focusing on the issues of terrorism in uh, the mid to late 90s, mostly because it, it became very uh, apparent that this old form of warfare, terrorism, which dates back to Sun Tzu, in fact, was uh, being reborn in the modern age due to the use of technology. And in fact, since we began studying terrorism in the late 90s, it became very evident that the terrorists of today found very novel ways of using technology, first airliners, as weapons against us. Now the issue is how can we use the technologies and the sciences of today to counter this old scourge that we're still dealing with uh, even today, as we celebrate the first anniversary of the death of Osama bin Laden. At the Potomac Institute, we were very fortunate to be able to attract and, and keep at the Institute Professor Yona Alexander, who, had, who heads the Center for, uh, for uh, International Center for Terrorism Studies here at the Potomac Institute. He's also affiliated with the Inter-University Center for Legal Studies. And once again, I'm very, very privileged and happy to have co-sponsor of this event, Professor Don Wallace at the end of the table, who has been a very long time partner with the Potomac Institute in addressing these issues and making sure that we address not just the technical and policy aspects, but the legal aspects as well. Professor Alexander put together a book in 2000 that was published in, I believe, January and February of 2001 that profiled a, a network known as Al-Qaeda. This book was published nine months before the events of 9-11, uh, and I'm proud to say that before 9-11, we sold, a, uh, I think, 340 copies. After 9-11, between September and December, we sold about 150,000 copies. Today, it's available in, in uh, I think, two dozen languages and around the world as one of the first volumes that articulated what this network was and who were in it. One of the things that that book featured most was a set of pictures that were obtained publicly on the members of Al-Qaeda at the time, the, the famous original 53, which became the targets of the last couple administrations. And in fact, it's been the policy of the last couple administrations to target Al-Qaeda as a set of individuals that we need to take out. Today, I think, Many people, as you've heard in the last day or so, are, be, are claiming great success in that uh, mission to target Al-Qaeda. There are very few uh, members of the, uh, of the original organization left, some say one or two. There's only a few members of those of the organization who joined since 9-11 left, and those that are left are certainly been driven into hiding. I think the question today on whether Al-Qaeda is defeated or not is a question of whether targeting the individuals of the organization and succeeding in taking them out is in fact winning the war. Frederick Kagan wrote in 2003 in Policy Review an article called War and Aftermath that it's a fundamental mistake to see the enemy as a set of targets. The enemy in war is a group of people. Some of them need to be killed, some of them captured, some of them driven into hiding. The overwhelming majority, however, will, will have to be persuaded. So I think the question that I would throw on the floor today is not whether we have successfully targeted and killed those who associated themselves with Al-Qaeda over the years, but whether we have successfully addressed and countered the message that caused those to join the organization in the first place. I think it's an open question and one that I hope each of our speakers will address in their own way as we uh, talk to them today, uh, but I'd like to start that discussion off with a gift to them of the 10th anniversary book that Yona has, uh, has uh, produced uh, along with me, 
to uh, articulate all of the activities over the last 10 years against Al-Qaeda. So with that, Yona, if you'll help me, we'd like to give to our speakers each a copy of the book. Okay. Go ahead, pass it on. It, it's, uh, if nothing else, is a really good paperweight. <laughs> and a good symbol of the tremendous work that Professor Alexander and the Center, International Center for Terrorism Studies is responsible for here at the Institute day in and day out. I'd like to personally thank him for his dedication uh, uh, to all issues of studying all issues of terrorism and doing it in the most professional academic way. I think that uh, most of you will agree that Professor Alexander is, a, is absolutely a world treasure when it comes to these types of issues and we wouldn't be anywhere near as deep as we are in understanding them without him. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jonah Alexander. the audience, since uh, CISPEN is generous to uh, broadcast uh, this uh, event to bring it to a larger audience in the U.S. and abroad, uh, if you could kindly turn off your uh, cell phone, if possible. We like uh, music, but not now. Um, now we want to uh, thank uh, CISPEN again. We want to thank Lori Kinney here for uh, recording this and make it, uh, making the, the seminar available, I think, almost uh, uh, immediately. Now, um, I would like to make a few footnotes, like an academic, very brief, because we have a very rich uh, panel, and we would like to develop some uh, discussion. Now, uh, Mike uh, mentioned uh, some of her work and studies. Uh, again, um, to provide some context, uh, obviously uh, nothing is new under the sun, as we know. And uh, for uh, decades, we tried to uh, academically, again, to achieve uh, two, uh, two aims. Uh, one is to learn the past lessons uh, and secondly, to try to anticipate uh, the future. We had uh, last month here uh, in the same room, uh, we had a seminar on Nigeria. And uh, in fact, uh, it is uh, interesting that going back to 1980, since uh, Shireen Hunter uh, was at the time uh, also at the CSIS, I'm mentioning that, that we developed a research project on international violence. We didn't want to use even the term terrorism at the time because we worked together with the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. And now we're discussing Bakul Haram and the affiliates of the Al-Qaeda. At the same time, uh, we also try to develop some capability to learn about state-sponsored terrorism. And again, going back to 1980, we published the first uh, study on Iran together with the Congressional Research Service in, in, in the Library of Congress uh, at the time because of the request of some members of Congress. <coughs> and we continued uh, over the years. Uh, I would like to mention uh, most uh, recently, because it is connected with Al-Qaeda, in case uh, you missed that, we uh, just published a, a report uh, related to North Africa, West Africa, and Central Africa from 9-11 to the Arab Spring. And uh, I would like to, to commend uh, our team, also researchers who are sitting in the back there, the next generation, we are very proud of them, who contributed the research to this study. Uh, finally, I, I would like to mention that uh, we're trying to cooperate with uh, international organizations such as the United Nations and NATO 
And uh, one of our recent uh, activity and publication is a journal called Partnership for Peace that is being uh, published uh, in Ankara, Turkey, because of the mission of Turkey to combat uh, terrorism, uh, working very closely with uh, NATO. Now, I recall uh, very vividly that uh, Jim uh, Wolsey, um, after the Cold War, uh, he made a, a statement uh, before Congress uh, related uh, actually to the nature of the threat, the instability, and he indicated that during the Cold War, it was very simple, in a way, to deal with a big dragon. But in the post-Cold War, we have to deal with a situation of ma many snakes in the garden that we cannot identify. This uh, obviously brings me to to the question of uh, the Al-Qaeda and uh, the, the challenge of uh, Al-Qaeda basically in terms of the short-term and the long-term um, aims and goals and uh, what direction Al-Qaeda is taking. Um, I would like to, to mention now that um, we, we do have a very distinguished uh, panel you do have um, basically their CV. I'm not going to, to read it at this, this time except to, to indicate that um, each and every one specialized in this uh, particular uh, area. And because of the uh, time factor and some, some of the panelists uh, have to leave uh, earlier, I would like to invite first uh, Mark Levitt, Matthew Levitt, who is, uh, as you know, the director of the terrorism program at the Washington Institute on Middle East uh, Policy. Good afternoon. Thank you, Yona. Uh, and thanks also for accommodating my teaching schedule at SICE. I know Mary and Shireen and others can appreciate, but uh, uh, the students uh, aren't, aren't very uh, uh, understanding when you arrive as late as maybe I did here uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very much. You know, if you read the papers uh, this weekend, uh, you might come to the conclusion that, uh, that we're done, um, that uh, Al-Qaeda is all but over. And, uh, and we're on the right trajectory. I might agree with that second half, that we're on the right trajectory, um, but we're not yet uh, where we need to be. Um, we will be, I believe, at some point in the not too distant future at a period where we, people won't be talking about Al-Qaeda as such, maybe the Al-Qaeda core as such. But the uh, global insurgency that bin Laden created, where I think he was far more successful than he ever dreamed he would be, in creating a, a movement that has become an idea is something we're going to be dealing with for some time. I don't lose a whole lot of sleep worrying, uh, is it Al-Qaeda? Is it Al-Qaeda affiliated? Is it Al-Qaeda affiliate wannabe? As much as I worry about what are the capabilities of those who are intent on doing us and our allies harm. And across that spectrum, we still have a lot that we have to deal with. The fact of the matter is, it has been a fantastic year for those involved in counterterrorism. It has. We're about to celebrate the one-year anniversary of the takedown of bin Laden. That cannot be uh, stressed enough how important that was. First of all, many of us, myself included, apparently were mistaken when we believed that bin Laden himself wasn't as involved in things as he apparently was. Mary was one of the few who, who kept saying that he was involved. Um, I stand corrected. Uh, the fact is, we now know from the treasure trove of intelligence that uh, came out in Abbottabad, the man was very involved. Not on a day-to-day -day basis, because when you engage in secure communications through a courier, that takes a few days' time. But he was reaching out to Boko Haram. He was reaching out to people and, and coming up with ideas and, and giving OK for ideas. And we know now already, thinking about plots to target the President of the United States and thinking about plots targeting uh, trains, etc. Taking him out was important not only because he was more involved than we thought. Taking him out was also important because it removed 
the face, the man, the name behind the movement uh, of Al-Qaeda. And that was a tremendous blow, I believe, to their foot soldiers uh, and to those who seek to uh, radicalize others to follow in his image. It also left in his place the, uh, uh, as, a, as a leader, Ayman al-Zawahiri, who is the human uh, being equivalent of sandpaper. Uh, not a pleasant individual. Uh, he doesn't have that magnetism that bin Laden has. If anything, there's good reason to hope that he will push some people away. It might create some fissures within the larger uh, al-Qaeda and affiliated movements, which is a kind of general catch-all term we use. And that might be successful. Uh, something might breed more success as well. But perhaps, perhaps the greatest achievement was catching that treasure trove of intelligence. A couple of weeks after uh, the raid, uh, the Washington Institute had a conference, and we had the National Security Advisor there. It was the first time anyone said publicly that the amount of information collected in Abbottabad was the equivalent of the library of a small liberal arts college here in the United States. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, of pieces of information, documents, audio, etc. Going through that, going through it again, going through it again, uh, which is something that's been ongoing throughout this year, uh, and the triage now appears to be complete, that will be something that people will continue to go through, and you're already getting more bits and pieces of that coming out, which t gets us uh, to this weekend's uh, press. I think what you're going to be hearing a lot, and you'll be hearing more, is a lot of politicking. Neither party has a monopoly on that, unfortunately, which means we're going to hear it from both sides. We're going to hear about how much more there is to do. We're going to hear about how, how far we've come. And all of that's to be taken with a grain of salt. I'm much more interested in what the uh, career people who tend not to speak to the press have to say than what the Secretary of Defense says one day and then retracts the next day, as others have as well, in terms of where we are in terms of Al Qaeda or Al Qaeda being dead. Uh, I think we have, we have some ways to go. But beyond the takedown of bin Laden, the much larger story from this year, from the past two years, is the Arab Spring, which some now call the Islamist winter. Wherever you are on that spectrum, however you see the events, they are cataclysmic. But it's a huge shot to Al-Qaeda's ideology. The simple fact that Al-Qaeda, through years and years of bloody violence, maintaining that the only way to take down regimes like the Mubarak regime was through violence, and that you couldn't only engage in that near jihad against Egypt, you had to engage in the far jihad against the United States, which supports it. All of that turned out to be bogus. In the end, a relatively small group of liberal-minded, moderate-minded, for the most part, Arab and Muslim youth, college kids, armed not with weapons but with iPhones, took down the Mubarak regime. In other words, there is an alternative. And I wish that we in the West would do better at promoting that or other alternative messages. I think that is, as you heard in the opening remarks, where counterterrorism is going to go in the future. I've, I've worked at the FBI in counterterrorism. I've led, or was the deputy chief of one of the US intelligence agencies, one of the smallest ones at Treasury, to be sure, but one nonetheless. I am convinced, I am convinced, that we do tactical terrorism, counterterrorism, really well. There's, never, uh, there's no such thing as 100% in counterterrorism. There will always be attacks that get through. But we are increasingly good at disruption, at taking on those that are trying to carry out the next attack. Where I worry is that we are still pitiful at strategic counterterrorism, at throwing a wrench in the process by which people become radicalized into thinking that carrying out an act of political violence or terrorism, call it what you may, is the right, only maybe, most effective way to further your political, religious, or whatever other idea or, or agenda it is. We are not where we need to be there yet. And that is where I believe bin Laden has been more successful than he could ever have dreamed of being. When I think about the terrorist threat today, I don't only think about the Al-Qaeda core, and I frankly lose patience with people who spend all their time debating what is the Al-Qaeda core today. You know, we in the United States in particular, in the West in general, we are in need of instant gratification. I have four sons, believe me, they are in need of instant <laughs> gratification. The fact of the matter is our adversaries work in a much longer time frame. So we want to know right now, what is Al-Qaeda? Well, right now it's one thing, but tomorrow, next week, next month, it's going to be potentially something very, very different. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm a little bit tired with those who are only interested in assessing where is the Al-Qaeda core. Or even those who want to know where are the Al-Qaeda affiliates, because today is Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula that's most capable of targeting us at home, and that is true. And that's Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb that's found a new and creative way 
not so new, and frankly not so creative, but new and creative for Al-Qaeda, in kidnapping for ransom to raise money, a group that had been floundering because it was working on a budget of just a few thousand dollars and a few kidnappings for ransom, and suddenly they've got tens of millions of dollars. Or whether it's other Al-Qaeda affiliates, Shabaab, Boko Haram in Africa, which is going to be a growth industry for counterterrorism, my biggest fear is the homegrown, trend in homegrown violent extremism, which, by the way, is not limited to radical Islamist extremism, but that is the majority, the largest threat we face today. And the reason that keeps me up at night is because my time in the intelligence community and my time in law enforcement leads me to believe that we are best capable tactically at thwarting the next attack when the people who are plotting the next attack may set off one of the tripwires we put in place, whether it's travel or communication or moving or receiving money. But if we're trying now to deal with people who, who have no job or were dumped by their girlfriend and are looking for meaning and they find it in radical extremism by looking at some online website and they're sitting in their mother's basement and they've never crossed law enforcement, they don't have a jaywalking ticket, nothing to their name, we have no way to know about these people perhaps until an hour too late. That's what keeps me up at night. You have a lot of panelists here, all of whom know infinitely more than I do. So I will simply end by saying this. With all of the things that we're discussing today, recent events indicate and remind us that we don't only face a threat from radical Sunni extremism within the Islamist context. There's a rise now of Shia extremism as well, not only from Iran, but from Hezbollah. And you can look you no know, farther than attacks in India and Georgia, the country, not the state, India, etc., to see that this is something that we're going to be dealing with uh, and, and at least over the next year, probably longer as well. I want to thank the Potomac Institute for having me out. It's an honor to serve with such a prestigious panel, and I thank you all for coming here this afternoon. Thank you. You know, I'm going to uh, I'm going to stay right here. If yeah, you know. that's that's okay. Oh, yeah, I've done that too. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> Matt, uh, just again a, a footnote. Uh, you 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 mentioned that we don't have to worry only about the Al-Qaeda. In fact, uh, this month of uh, April, I think, uh, marks uh, the attack on Oklahoma City uh, that we have to uh, keep in mind, as you uh, indicated. Also, it's uh, 32 years after the failed American rescue mission uh, in Iran. So the, the past 30 years, I think, we had to deal with restoring American credibility and confidence. And this, this uh, particular event, uh, the mission to kill Ben Laden, certainly is a major significant uh, development. OK, General David Risk. Thank you, Yona. Uh, daughters offer the same instant gratification as sons do for, for those that, uh, that also share my uh, dilemma. Glad to hear it. Al Qaeda Quo Vadis. As a Marine, I had to look it up just to make sure. Where are you going? Uh, they need to ask three <coughs> questions. Where does Al-Qaeda want to go? Where can Al-Qaeda go? And where do we want Al-Qaeda to go? First, let's address it what the, the death of bin Laden meant. I'm not sure. I am sure the pressure, the military, the economic put on Al-Qaeda has caused Al-Qaeda to adapt, to morph, or to mutate. Most view that bin Laden's death as a good thing. But we must ask if his death now causes us to, de to deal with the new strain of Al-Qaeda, and what does that strain look like? When you have a game plan set, and then the other team changes, you need to adjust. War and life is about adaptation, and especially in war, he who adapts quickest will have an advantage. If Al-Qaeda under bin Laden looked the same after his death, there is no adaptation required. Attempting to extrapolate what Al-Qaeda will look like, what Al-Qaeda will do, what Al-Qaeda will become, is uncertain. As Yogi Berra stated, prediction is hard, especially about the future. Second, where does Al-Qaeda want to go and where can they go? Assuming they have not shifted from their original views and methods, we are dealing with people on the fringe. They believe in their cause and we believe in ours. This gets to truth, and truth can be relative. Almost digressing to myth, a myth is powerful. Degrees of the fringe vary from country to country, and we have some fringe people within our country, and they exist throughout the world. When truth can't be agreed upon, especially between nations, 
violence invariably results. Third, where do we want Al-Qaeda to go? Of course we want them eliminated because of the damage they are doing. But is there any way we could shape the future of Al-Qaeda? Unfortunately, the nature of the world right now does not offer many alternatives. With global economic woes, expanding global growth, poverty that results in ignorance and want, reliance on oil, and an emerging culture in some arenas that believe you can reason with anyone and everyone. Two examples come to mind in shaping actions. In the book, In the Ruins of the Empire, that deals with the Japanese surrender in the battle for post-war Asia, members of the OSS met with Ho Chi Minh in 1945 and received, and received assurances that the Viet Minh were ready to cooperate with the Americans in fighting the Japanese. Major Allison Thomas parachuted in near Hanoi, remained with the Viet Minh for more than two months, Army, training, select forces for operations against the Japanese. In Anbar province in 2004, Sunni sheikhs and U.S. <coughs> Marines engaged and looked at alternatives to war. These meetings saw an alternative to Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and the sheikhs saw no goodness in Al-Qaeda coming to Anbar and in Iraq writ large. The Marines who made this outreach were civil affair group Marines, reservists, names no one here would ever know. They were exceptionally creative. They, along with their Sheikh counterparts, believed that people wanted a lifestyle just a bit better for themselves and a better future for their children, and fundamentally that poor men want to get rich and rich men want to get richer. And war in their backyard does not bring about that end state. It was not until 2006 that the U.S. was able to embrace this concept. This is termed the awakening, but ask yourself who was awakened, us or them? In closing, let's discuss some fundamentals in dealing with Al-Qaeda. Be blunt, be decisive, be brutal, separate religion from their cause, and take advantage of opportunities. In being blunt, leave no doubt what you say and what you will do, and then do it. When you do it, be decisive and be brutal is the only way. Some today have lost sight that war is cruelty, there is no use trying to reform it, and the crueler it is, the sooner it will be over. General Sherman stated this at the close of the U.S. Civil War in 1865, and it remains true today. When the dogs of war are released, don't be surprised at the resultant carnage. In some ways, we are Pollyannish in our country. Our fight is not with the Muslim faith, but we have muddied this water. When a person is bad, they are bad regardless of their skin color or their religious affiliation. Be decisive and brutal at that point. Opportunities will exist, but they must be realized and exploited, and this is exceptionally difficult. Imagine the difference if Ho Chi Minh had been given an alternative path, or if the awakening had occurred in 2004 instead of 2006 in Anbar. And I do not want to trivialize, trivialize the complexity of these matters, but we will have opportunities. Thank you very much, Owen. Thank you. Um, thank you. Professor Sharin Hunter, this is a professor at Georgetown uh, University, uh, as well as a distinguished <coughs> scholar at the Center for Strategic International Studies. That's only also Oh, that's okay. No, you need to talk. It's fine. Can I do that too? Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry about that. It's always that I'm out of practice. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank my uh, old but young friend. In other words, we have known each other for a long time. And uh, actually, we wrote stuff together, too, at some point uh, to, to the 80s, which I guess dates both of us. Secondly, I have to say that uh, I feel a little bit uh, like a <coughs> fish out of water because it's been quite a while that I haven't really focused on terrorism but, and for that such. I used to be doing it a lot in the 80s. Um, so, uh, and of course, uh, surrounded uh, by people that uh, both uh, professionally and of course academically, um, this is their specialty. So I feel a little bit, uh, uh, shall we say, that uh, apprehensive. But I will um, try to uh, um, see what I can contribute uh, to the debate that uh, hopefully will be of some use. 
Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, I personally am extremely happy that uh, Bin Laden has been dispatched uh, uh, to some uh, 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 warm place, uh, a hot place. So I think that uh, that is uh, uh, quite good. And definitely, uh, we can say that um, uh, today, uh, I'm just going by reading uh, the uh, a talk of uh, Ayman al Zawahiri when he was actually appointed uh, the successor, or, or he was chosen rather, I should say, a successor to that. That uh, it was uh, really, I mean, he, uh, you could see it uh, beneath the um, luster and everything that there was concern that they were dealing, including what he was saying that, you know, now of course we have trouble getting money and. Uh, you know, people have to come, and, and, and our friends uh, should help us more in Pakistan and other places. So obviously, uh, this has been a, a, a trauma for them. And in every organization, even like um, uh, al uh, when you suffer such a blow, it takes a, a, a while, a long while, that you can, uh, you can be put. But what I'm going to try to uh, focus on here is basically, uh, actually, I think that also what Matt was saying about that um, tactical and strategic and, and looking uh, at the you know, uh, forces that give us people like Bin Laden and Ozawahiri and so on, and of course in light of the Arab Spring, a little bit uh, to talk about the context uh, and to see that uh, if, when one is uh, trying to develop uh, a broader uh, sort of counterterrorism strategy, <coughs> what are some of the issues that one has to do? I think that obviously there are certain things happens that the United States uh, um, does not have control over it, which uh, help uh, uh, in the development of movements such as al -Qaeda. For example, um, the United States is not instigate the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, but once the Soviets uh, invaded Afghanistan, you know, we had to go and do our job. Um, but it's also, we have to understand that uh, the Soviet-Afghan war was the crucible in which this whole uh, jihadist thing uh, uh, really emerged uh, and, and, and blossomed. Now, I'm not suggesting that uh, Sayyid al-Qutub, uh, well, Sayyid al-Qutub had written all these things in the 1950s, but uh, this had not been completely operationalized. And so what happened that this whole Soviet-Afghan uh, war uh, really became the crucible of jihad. The word jihad, mujahid, and, and, and became legitimized. This is something that we have to understand. There is a direct link between conflict and this types of uh, act of terror. And also, uh, the other thing that happened with the uh, 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 Soviet-Afghan war uh, was that Pakistan, underwent a tremendous change. And here also the actions of some of our allies, you know, I, I don't generally miss words. Maybe if I had, I would have been in a better shape now. But the fact of the matter is that there was a fundamental change that occurred in Pakistan's Islamic culture. Uh, the Obandis always existed in the subcontinent, uh, but they got a new lease of life with this sort of proselytizing that went on. Um, and these new madrasas that happened, uh, these did, did not exist in Pakistan before. And I have been both to Pakistan and Afghanistan in the prior to Soviet Afghan invasion, so I know what I'm a little bit talking about. It's almost unrecognizable. So I think that this is another thing that uh, we have uh, uh, to keep in mind. Everywhere else that you see that uh, the jihadist idea migrated, whether it was in Bosnia or whether it was in Chechnya, um, it, it just migrated from Afghanistan, and it migrated with Pakistan. And, and so we have to also uh, really keep in mind uh, that who were the people that helped develop, whether it was financially, or whether it was ideologically, uh, and so on and so forth. And here I come to this whole so-called Salafist idea, which is a euphemism for something that we all know, so I don't need to say it in television. And this is another dilemma we have that we have to come to terms. And if we don't come to terms with it, I don't know how we are going to address. Now, where is going to go? Why is it that the whole question of uh, terrorism uh, is difficult to resolve? I think one of the things that we are seeing happening, and I hope that it will stay that way, although Europe is different if you judge by the horrendous uh, killing that happened in, um, in Toulouse, 
the clinic was heart wrenching. And apparently, the person involved in that uh, claimed that he had the connection with this uh, uh, new kind of group in Kazakhstan called uh, Jundal Khalifa, uh, who they say that it's another one of those who, uh, what I call it, franchise. You know, I think that uh, um, Al-Qaeda has become the McDonald's or the uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken of terrorism. They, uh, everybody is opening a, a franchise. I mean, whether they are connected with, <coughs> excuse me, Al-Qaeda or not, to give their local thing. This is another thing. A lot of these issues have also local local uh, roots that unfortunately um, Al-Qaeda is trying to uh, uh, um, um, export. And in definitely in Central Asia, <coughs> in the area that I look into more rather than you know, Nigeria or other places. Um, definitely, you know, Kazakhstan until recently didn't have a, a Islamist militant or terrorist problem as much as they do right now. So these are some of the things that are um, going to happen. But in terms of future doing what we have to do, we have two problems. And one of it is the ambiguity of the local states about the uses and abuses of terrorist groups. Um, you know, terrorism also has to be bad um, against whomever this is perpetrated. And the minute that people have a selective approach to the use of terror, uh, then it becomes uh, uh, difficult. You know, in other words, if you uh, some groups that uh, against the country or something that uh, a local power or others don't like, then they call them, you know, um, liberation movements or whatever. And I can go on and on. I can name names if need be, uh, but I prefer not to. Um, and so the ambiguous role of state vis-a-vis -vis the terrorist groups. And of course, the most significant factor in here is Pakistan. I mean, the idea that bin Laden was roaming around in Pakistan, and the Pakistanis didn't know about that, to me, I'm sorry. It just uh, uh, strains uh, credibility to a point of uh, uh, impossibility. So this is one thing that we have to do. Um, if Pakistan cannot even uh, protect its own uh, uh, Shia population, and, um, you know, and we have to separate the Shias from Iran, that is a fact because you have 160 million Shia, and of that only maybe 65 million are, are in Iran. So the other 100 million, that the way they treat it, it's, it's separate, totally completely different thing, and we have to separate. Now the idea that ISI doesn't know that that Karen is, is slaughtering the Shias in Parachanar, it seems to me that it is. Uh, or that we do know that Pakistan government probably helped with the Lashkar Taiba to carry out the things in, in, in Mumbai and so on. So this is some of the things that we have to keep in mind, that it is not just al Qaeda. What or how these uh, terrorist groups are used in regional rivalries. Where al Qaeda is going? Well, I think al Qaeda is actually developing a more sectarian force. The sectarian focus of al Qaeda was very, very clear in Ayman al-Zawahiri's uh, speech. In that, he very clearly referred to the Persians. He said, these Persians, the heathen Persians are doing this, and they are becoming really strong in Lebanon, in Syria, and so on and so forth. And of course, now that he's trying to piggyback on, for example, uh, what is going on now on, on, on Syria, it is very much becoming uh, also sectarian director. Uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq was a sectarian element, again, linked with regional uh, um, rivalries and so on and so forth. What does Arab Spring mean for Al-Qaeda? Any time that there is a political process and that where people can, including the Salafis, which I hope they remain uh, in, uh, in minority. And, and I'm not very pleased actually that they are going to support this Islamic in Egypt. But every time that there is an, a, a route that you can go to a political <coughs> means, uh, the likelihood of that local groups uh, will this, this, this kind of disconnect themselves from the uh, kind of the headquarters. Al-Qaeda, after all, means headquarters. 
Um, so we, we, we have to wait and see. But for, uh, to me, it seems to me that uh, the Arab Spring probably is the worst thing that could have happened to, uh, for Al Qaeda. And they are going to have to uh, play uh, 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 and catch up with that. And I agree with you, Matt, that uh, um, it shows that um, if, even if you want to get rid of uh, a, a a corrupt government, whether it is Egypt, Syria, Iran, and whatever. There are many of them around, so <laughs> nobody has a, um, a sort of monopoly on corruption, unfortunately, and repression. Um, then, uh, uh, you know, uh, there are local factors for it. It's not America that does this all the time. In other words, if somebody wants to be corrupt, if Americans don't go and say that, why don't you go and steal from your people? You know, that, that this is not really what's happening. Um, and so that uh, you can you can have you can take action within your own country, uh, and of course there is a political uh, root to that. Uh, however, if this experience of uh, um, if one can call events that has happened in Arab Spring quite peaceful, it uh, doesn't work out. <coughs> then I don't think that Al Qaeda, in the sense of the kind of the terrorism central or or the terrorism cointer, it never really had existed as such. Um, but nevertheless, a, a place where uh, everybody can look to, like some kind of, uh, uh, again, this is a misnomer, but some sort of a spiritual headquarters that everybody uh, sort of tries to get legitimacy by affiliating itself to them and then Laden, if it becomes. Um, then this thing, again, might uh, 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 develop. The other thing is that targets of terrorism change, depending where, uh, where, um, grievances tend to uh, exist and where the opportunities exist. So I think that this is one of the problems. For example, the Russians, uh, because I know a little bit more about terrorism in the Caucasus and Central Asia than I do other places. I follow the Chechen thing very much. I, the Chechen issue has not you know, finished yet. But when the Russians felt that Chechnya had been pacified, and now they're having more problems with Dagestan, and they're having problems in Agidea and, and in, in Ingushetia and so on and so forth. So as long as those problems are there, they are going to, you know, continue. So I guess I have talked more than I should have, and I apologize for that. But I hope, you know, there was something useful in it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shireen. Of course, we will have some uh, questions very shortly. I would like to call on uh, Dr. Mary Eba to uh, speak. She is an associate professor of strategic studies at Johns Hopkins uh, University. Please. Um, I'd like to begin by um, apologizing for my early departure as well. Like Matt, I need to teach uh, immediately afterwards, so we're actually going to be departing together, Matt. Um, and I'd also like to apologize because I feel that I'm going to throw some rhetorical bombs here and then run out the door before everybody can sort of But I'll definitely be leaving with you. <laughs> but I'm not leaving because I'm avoiding the discussion because I think this is an important discussion. I'm going to have some, some very strong views, though, and I think especially the person to my left is going to disagree profoundly with me. And um, if I'm not able to stay here for the entire discussion, please forgive me. I'm happy to engage uh, some, other, some other time. Um, so let me begin by saying that I agree with Matt and others who have said that um, the death of bin Laden is extremely important. Uh, this was, after all, you know, the founder, chief inspire, radicalizer, chief, the, the guy who um, had so much charisma uh, that he was able to convince a whole lot of people uh, to go out and kill themselves um, for a cause. So I don't want to minimize um, uh, what the death of bin Laden has meant. Um, but um, as with others, I don't believe that it has killed off Al-Qaeda or even that it has led to the strategic defeat of the group. Uh, nor do I think that the Arab Spring, as it has developed, um, has, uh, has led to the death of, uh, of uh, Al-Qaeda. Um, there was a, a, a point last year when there were, there were a lot of hopes, including some that I had, that this might point out a, a different path, especially in places like Egypt. Um, but um, as it's developed, I don't think that it's led to the strategic defeat of, of Al-Qaeda. Um, and this is because um, I, I, I profoundly disagree with a, an accepted, settled view of what Al-Qaeda is. Um, in fact, my definition of a group, um, mine is a very tiny group of extremists, apparently, 
um, half of the group, and that is I don't think it's a terrorist group at all. Um, it was in the 1990s. I agree uh, that in the 1990s uh, that was all it was able to be. They had a few hundred followers. It had these wacky dreams and fantasies about what it was going to accomplish. Um, and it was confined to Sudan and then off to the wilds of, of Afghanistan, where it could do basically nothing, right? So um, in the 1990s, I agree, um, it was a terrorist group. Uh, but it always had these sort of aspirations for bigger things. And if you take a look at the captured documents um, that we have in our hands from uh, our war in Afghanistan in 2001-2002, uh, what you see is they were spending 90% of their money on training Mujahideen and on uh, regular combat troops, and only 10% of their money on what they called special operations, that is, the attacks on the United States. So even back in the 1990s, they had aspirations, although unfulfilled aspirations, for bigger and better things. And they were spending a lot of time and most of their effort on developing those rather than on attacking the United States. And I would just also like to say right here at the beginning, that one of the things that has profoundly distorted this entire discussion is our views of 9-11 and how we've made this all about us. It's not about us, really. 9-11 um, made us think that uh, you know everything that's going on out in the world that has the name Al-Qaeda attached to it is about us, but it, but it really wasn't. Um, the, the fact that eight times as many Muslims have been killed um, out in the world since 9-11 versus uh, Americans should tell us something about where Al-Qaeda is focusing its attention and its main effort. So um, I think 9-11 distorted the discussion quite a bit. Um, that's because um, I think also we've misunderstood what Al-Qaeda's objectives are. All right? We believe that their main objective of Al-Qaeda core is to attack the United States. When in fact that's a means towards an end. We've confused means with objectives which in you know, strategic thought, strategic planning is one of the basic mistakes you can make and which leads to all sorts of confusion about what needs to be done, the kinds of policies you need to adopt in order to take on and defeat a group. So um, the means were attack the United States, get the U.S. out of uh, Muslim countries entirely. Bin Laden had this complete fantasy that was in fact um, disputed by a lot of the, the members of Al-Qaeda back in the 1990s that the U.S. was uh, this cowardly country that could simply carry out a few attacks and the U.S. would run for it. Um, but then what was he planning on doing afterwards? Well, that was the real strategic plan because that leads to his real objectives, which I think are fourfold, and which they have expressed multiple, multiple times, not just in um, open statements and articles written by Al-Qaeda analysts and things like that, but also in the few captured documents that we have from Iraq that are public. These things are expressed multiple, multiple times. So here's the objective of Al-Qaeda as expressed in these writing statements repeatedly. I mean, basically, if you go back, and I, I have, and read every single statement made by um, Al-Qaeda's leaders uh, for the past 10 years, these are repeated um, ad nauseum. First and foremost, to overthrow all the rulers of Muslim-majority countries. Secondly, to impose their version of Sharia on all Muslims in those places and around the world if they're able to do it. Thirdly, to create what they call emirates, which are basically states, but they have very specific sorts of characters, uh, characteristics, and eventually to set up something they call the caliphate. And beyond that, they actually have a fifth objective, which I don't talk about because this really fits in the fantasy world, which was obviously world conquest, right? So um, those were really the five, but the four that they focus on all the time. They call it uh, making the word of God the highest. And, and to them, that means world conquest. So that, those were the fundamental objectives, sort of the grand strategic objectives of Al-Qaeda right from the start, things that they've spoken about repeatedly over and over again. And those really have nothing to do with terrorist attacks on the United States. Repeatedly, when they talk about their objectives, they don't say, <coughs> oh, and by the way, one of our main objectives also is to attack the United States. I think attacking the United States before 9-11 was about Bin Laden's kind of fantasy about what this would do, and after 9-11 was about recruiting and about showing people they were still relevant and about lots of other things, but not about those main objectives any longer. So um, 
that is why I call Al-Qaeda not in, uh, a terrorist group, because a terrorist group is a small secretive group, a few hundred people um, don't have uh, either the capabilities or the desire to expand further, unable to recruit people into their organization fast enough to replace them, and are incapable of holding territory and government. And when you look at Al-Qaeda uh, core, you could say, well, that's certainly what's going on. But as you pointed out, the term Al-Qaeda actually means headquarters. And in fact, their first term for themselves was the high command, something that's repeated also in these captured documents and elsewhere. The high command of something they hoped would be bigger, and which since about 2005, 2006, has begun to live up to these aspirations um, of, the, of the 1990s. They set out to create, which you call franchises, but they, they actually call branches of their organization. They believe that those branches are an integral part of their organization, are carrying out their orders. They're not um, off there on their own, they believe, um, simply um, conquering territory, doing all kinds of things um, that they shouldn't do. At least that's what they thought until um, Zarqawi came along. And suddenly, they couldn't just count on these guys to agree with them ideologically, to agree with them um, in a sort of um, general way about objectives, to agree with them about the strategies to go about achieving these, because our colleague was a huge lesson to them in what happens when you don't have tighter command and control. So before uh, about 2005, 2006, they were slowly creating something, and then as our colleague showed them what would happen if you allowed somebody to completely destroy your name, and uh, since that time, I think they have kept a much tighter sort of command and control than was possible before that time. I don't think it's any coincidence about the same time that Bin Laden moved into that place um, in Abbottabad. Because um, as you pointed out, uh, the, the way we knew about communications um, before uh, last year um, suggested that they used couriers only in order to, to carry their orders around. And, and that turned out to not be very very helpful at all, especially when you send off orders as Altia did uh, back in 2005. And uh, Zarqawi just says, no, thank you. I'm not going to do whatever you suggest. So um, in 2005, they moved from this house in Abbottabad. And, and uh, the early news reports from, uh, from you know, what was found in the house said, in fact, that there were um, fiber optic connections in the house. So to me, that answered a huge question that had been raised about my assertions that were backed up by very, very little evidence about command and control. I mean, I could see people doing what they ordered. I could see them putting out orders and people actually fulfilling them. But how precisely are you going to organize something like this on a global scale without some sort of tighter command and control? I couldn't understand how they were doing it. Um, although I, I should point out that command and control in an irregular war is a very, very different thing from command and control in a regular war. is always much looser, always have a chance for splintering of people disobeying orders and things like that, and, and has um, you know, general strategic guidance from the high command rather than specific daily updates required and things like that. So even in, in, uh, um, before I, I, I heard about uh, Abadabad, um, there was this recognition, at least by me, that we weren't talking about the kind of command and control that, for instance, the Pentagon um, exercises on combatant commanders around the world. Um, but um, uh, so uh, in, in 2009, 2010, I had some really rough conversations with people in which they attacked this notion of command and control at all. And I began to change my mind because the, the one um, thing that I couldn't answer was, how is he going to do this from a cave up in northern Wisconsin? And I was like, yeah, that's right. I, I can't imagine how he could do this for a cave in Northern Wisconsin. And as soon as I heard he was in a body I was like, wow, I think I'm getting it, you know? And as soon as I heard that there were these um, fiber optic connections, I was like, that answers an awful lot too, because you don't have to perhaps, perhaps depend entirely on some sort of courier system. There might be other methods that we can be using. Now, I'd like to um, finish by saying, that I understand that making this assertion, that is, that this is not a terrorist group, but is in fact the headquarters or high command of something that is attempting to become, or is in the process of becoming a global insurgency, has an awful lot of, of policy implications, some of which are tremendously unpalatable. So, um, but <laughs> I don't believe that you should ignore what uh, reality is telling you because one, you can't afford it, or two, you just don't like what reality is telling you, right? 
because the fact that we can't afford to carry out a global counterinsurgency in the way we did in Anbar province, for instance, um, should not make us uh, flinch from recognizing at least the, the scope of the problem we're dealing with. Right? So I, I understand that there are tremendous policy implications from everything I'm saying. And that first and foremost, it argues uh, that attrition is absolutely the wrong way to go. It will, in fact, um, encourage radicalization and recruitment. Um, and that our main method for combating these guys um, is, is probably adding to the problem rather than helping to solve it. There's an awful lot of places where it's the only thing we can be doing, though, right? We don't have partners. We don't have capabilities ourselves. We believe that that's it. Well, um, maybe that's true, maybe that's not. But um, to engage in a practice that is, in fact, worsening the problem for us on a daily basis is, is not the way to go if, in fact, we are not dealing with a terrorism problem, but are, in fact, dealing with the insurgency problem. So I, I'd just like to stop there, and please forgive me again for, for leaving early after throwing all these rhetorical questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. We'll wait a few minutes uh, before we come back to your ticking bomb. And we're going to, to ask our final uh, speaker, Dr. Thomas Lynch, who is a distinguished research fellow at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. And he retired from the military after, what, 26 years or so. Tom? Okay, thank you very much, Yona. Thank you. Have a good day. Uh, as Yona mentioned, I uh, am a research fellow over at the National Defense University, so let me just offer this opening comment. Uh, the comments I'm about to make to you here uh, neither represent the position of my host institution, National Defense University, or the Department of Defense, my ultimate employer, but in fact uh, the product of my own research and own individual conclusions. Uh, again, delighted to be here today, uh, and uh, as we near you know, the one-year anniversary um, of the uh, operation that eliminated bin Laden, uh, I'm here to contend, perhaps not as starkly as Mary has offered, uh, about diverging with her position, but I'm not here to contend to you that, that, that rather than overestimating the death of Bin Laden, we still underestimate and underappreciate the degree to which Bin Laden's death has really uh, clarified and made more understandable what, uh, and here's where I do disagree with Mary, what is not a global insurgency, but rather has been a radical ideology that has, has prospered under the leadership of a core and unique organization which tried to bring life to five separate dimensions of that particular diverse ideology and has attempted to get its arms around and try to channel it in the direction of the aims that Mary so eloquently pointed out here. What I'm here to contend to you is Bin Laden as a personality has been no less relevant than Lenin was to global communist ideology and be able to fuse and bring that together. And we misappreciate badly if we think Bin Laden's death isn't the equivalent of Lenin dying in Switzerland before making it into Russia. Because, much like Lenin, there was no other organizer of victory who brought together the charisma, the fundraising ability, and now as we know, and I was like Mary, convinced <coughs> that Bin Laden was a strategically relevant communicator with various and disparate outfits. And to a certain extent, I have to confess that I had insider knowledge. While still in uniform, I worked in U.S. CENTCOM and I worked in Afghanistan. And I worked on the problem of Iraq. And we knew Bin Laden personally was involved in communications to try to corral and bring under control uh, Zawahiri. We knew he was making outreach early on to al-Shabaab in Somalia. We knew he was involved in all these types of things, working through mediums and other individuals. But we knew he was there and doing that. And as a consequence, and no surprise when you're talking about a global ideology, Bin Laden was relevant. Consequently, his death changes or evolves or morphs Al-Qaeda and what it is, but it also leaves extant what I think Mary's referred to, Sharia's referred to, and Matthew's referred to, which is this wider issue of ideology, the global Salafi jihadi ideology, which I'm going to contend to you in a second, remains extant and really is the issue. But like a boulder being rubbled into small pebbles, when you take away the cohesion and the glue, and when you're left with, and I agree with Matthew here, sandpaper as the relevant cohesive idea when you take away Bin Laden from Bin Laden Zawahiri, then you are left with a different managerial problem, and one that I would contend needs an altered vocabulary to understand. Not that it's any less relevant, but that rather than being pursued and taken on 
in the language of a global conflagration or a quest against a global insurgent movement, that you instead focus a lot more on bringing down your overseas footprint so you aren't the metastasizing element in a lot of different places where you don't have to be. Second, that you focus more on special forces operations, indirect operations, and working with partner nations, some of whom may not share your particular proclivities about democracy in the short term, but who in the long term wish to see and see vanish this kind of same metastasized violent threat that Al-Qaeda is. And third, that you spend a lot more time on your intelligence and your police cooperation, because the rubble elements are less of a threat to do what Mary has correctly referred to as kind of the, the uh, outside-in approach that bin Laden and Zawahiri uniquely brought to Al-Qaeda, which was this notion that we are failing in trying to overthrow corrupt governments in the period of the 1990s, Algeria, um, Azerbaijan, other places. And we have to come together then to throw out this, uh, this uh, buttressing influence of Western nations. Uh, this indeed was the spark of uh, Al-Qaeda that was the most significant to altering the organization from what was the kind of chaos of the Salafi jihadi movement that metastasized uh, in the 1990s. <coughs> I'm arguing here, as I will in a couple of seconds, that our interest right now is in recognizing this change, backing off of the rhetoric of trying to take on every one of these affiliate groups as though they are some kind of an inherent threat to put on the mantle of what bin Laden and Zawahiri represented, or that Zawahiri himself, just because he proclaims he's influencing Syria, or he's involved in some type of plots in Yemen, really has anything other than a steering wheel disembodied from this bus of the wider ideology. Uh, and because we make a policy mistake if we move in that direction, when in reality, it is the voices of the Islamic world, where I've had the privilege of living in Qatar and Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan and Pakistan. It is those voices that indeed, at the end of the day, are going to find a path forward that moves uh, uh, in, in a more modern way without the resort to violence as the only way towards political change, which is the underpinning of Salafi jihadism and which Al-Qaeda opted and moved to organize and band together in a very uh, global <coughs> focus and therefore a very dangerous uh, set of activities that did galvanize our intention on 9-11, probably should have before, but did galvanize us on 9-11, but doesn't need to galvanize us in that same way right now. So, so what is it about Al-Qaeda that I say has changed? And indeed, I've written on this, and I've argued that bin Laden's death really is the 80% solution to the unique and acute problem that Al-Qaeda tried to graft itself on top of this Salafi jihadi movement brought to the fore. And the five elements of Al-Qaeda, uh, which, by the way, has been, as Murray correctly notes and orients, been oriented towards trying to co-opt and bring together these diffuse elements that are revolutionary uh, and are insurgent-based inside the Muslim world is, is really the following, I argue. First, it inspired to be a core organization dedicated to planning, recruiting, and training for, and really for organizing, this is the important word here, catastrophic global terrorist events against America, Westerners, and Zionist Crusader targets, especially in their homelands. And as Mary has correctly said, I think Matthew alluded to it as well, for the purpose of what? For the purpose of getting us out of Muslim lands so they could have free reign to topple these corrupt and what they believe to be brittle uh, autocratic Muslim regimes. Second, to serve as a vanguard for organizing and coordinating already existent re and regionally focused jihadist groups towards active violence against Muslim, correction, against American and Zionist crusader, crusaders in the Muslim lands, where their presence was believed to defile Islam and bring it to a level that was unacceptable. Third, and this is important, although a lesser included, an inspiration to the disaffected and lone wolf Muslims worldwide to act out on their frustrations through violence against symbols <coughs> of perceived oppression against Islam. Fourth, and very important, to serve as a brand name representing the kind of highest level <coughs> of this ideology uh, in bringing successful violence against the so-called crusader governments and officials uh, in which most senior leaders of the jihad remain free from serious punishment, penalty, or harm. And here, indeed, was this kind of notion, this mystical notion of Al-Qaeda prior to the uh, raid against bin Laden was this notion of impunity, that bin Laden and Zawahiri were immune. They could go, they could find succor, they could find a way to hide out, and there would, you know, this long arm of Americanism and Westernism couldn't get to them, all right? And then fifth, that they, that is Al-Qaeda, would serve as a base certain for the conquest of Afghanistan, and included in that is Western Pakistan, in the name of global jihad. And this is particularly important, and I write about this in the paper, because of the mystical origins as Shireen and Matthew have pointed to about where Al-Qaeda came from and how it built up at the end of the Soviet jihad period and how then it turned itself towards first these local jihadi activities and then eventually towards the galvanized framing and bringing together of 
uh, Zawahiri's is Egyptian Islamic Jihad with bin Laden's Al-Qaeda in the focus on the far enemy first in order to get and defeat the near enemy second. Now, these five elements, I argue, three of them have been totally castigated by the raid in Abbottabad, right? This notion of a brand name that was free from um, uh, free from uh, retribution or had impunity against uh, being captured or attacked, that was brought to its knees. And most of us who follow Jihadi websites saw that clearly over the next two to three months, okay? This notion of how, how could this have happened, uh, you know, followed by this, this, this claim and this desire to have revenge and revanche uh, for, for rage. But the notion of impunity and living above and beyond the law, that came crashing down by way of this raid. And I would argue to you that Zawahiri in particular, as well as several other of the limited number of remaining core group elements, still feel uh, the, the wrath of that because they are no longer seen as impunent. I, I would tell you here, we made it clear to the Pakistanis and others that any obvious intelligence on where Zawahiri is would produce the same type of response. And I think that's to the right, okay? And that's exactly where we need to be on this because even though he is sandpaper to um, bin Laden's glue, he still controls a cohort of well, uh, well trained and well capable Egyptians, um, and to a lesser extent, um, um, uh, Algerians who are very capable of, of attacks and, and should not be taken lightly. Uh, second, this notion of a core organization able to plan, recruit, and conduct successful overseas terrorist operations that has been put asunder in the last five to six years. We can all point to things that have been plotted or planned in Western Pakistan. And indeed, our intelligence has correctly identified that since at least 2006. But we've also shown an ability to intercept, adapt, and then work with partners to include the much maligned, and deservedly so, but the very Janus-based ISI in Pakistan to corral and arrest a number of these folks who were plotting very massive attacks uh, in Western Europe, and in some cases against us in the homeland, or to find the critical bits of information that have allowed us to intercept those plotters that would be here. And so Al-Qaeda as a core organization, I would argue to you, no longer has that kind of cachet or that kind of capability. Nor do I think it can regain it based upon who's left alive or not. And the monograph I, I published in February kind of lists those who are left out there, who I argue, other than Zawahiri, have limited capability to reorganize this kind of a group. And finally, this notion of uh, a base for certain conquest in Afghanistan is dashed. And there I argue particularly that the relationship between bin Laden and Mullah Omar and the Haqqani group was, was really a personal relationship. And I think we're starting to see a little more nuggets of that coming out now with people releasing from Abadabad. Not that Zawahiri wasn't in play here, but Zawahiri and the Egyptians never swore an oath or a bayat to Mullah Omar. And, and my read of the situation there, having lived in that part of the world and done a lot of work uh, with the thankful assistance of Peter Berg and Stephen Call and others, uh, suggests to me very strongly <coughs> that it is not the ideological linkage to Al-Qaeda anymore that matters most to Omar, uh, Haqqani, and Hekmadiyar, but rather the strategic linkage to Pakistan and how far Pakistan wishes to see notions that the jihad from Western Pakistan is being fomented into an international uh, problem, either for Americans or Chinese or others, that that's the constraining break right now on that particular part of the world. So what does that leave us? Well, I think it leaves us with kind of half the other two of the five key things of Al-Qaeda that are left out there that we do legitimately have to worry about, but we need to take a different tack and an approach, and one that I would argue to you I think we're seeing we're taking already. And this has to do with an attack and approach that says, reduce the footprint of American military and Western military where you can, orient around special forces, indirect strikes, technology, and better police coordination. <coughs> And that's kind of where I think we're headed in Yemen and Somalia, maybe a little slow for some of our liking, uh, but where we need to get to. And also, that as a consequence, we should expect that Al-Qaeda is trying to attempt to inspiration, really try to co-opt these regional groups will continue. But again, the bus analogy. Let's be careful about making sure that the handle on the wheel is connected to the bus and not just a claim or an attempt to claim ownership, virtual ownership of something that has a lot more local roots and origins that can be addressed at that level. And second, the issue of the lone wolf terrorist and attacker, where I think we're even in the United States finally starting to come to grips with this right now, and I refer you to the most recent counterterrorism strategy, where the phrase resilience comes up a lot, over and over and over again. <coughs> And that has to do with the fact that, you know, no matter how good we are in counterterrorism activities, we're never going to do away with the lone wolf or the inspired individual that shows up regrettably at the recruiting station, okay, or with a, with a claim of self-professed internet activity that, you know, caused me to read the Al-Qaeda website, you know, one of the 
several hundred thousand that are out there uh, that claim they're affiliated and go off and do something negative. They're harder to get to, but they're less catastrophic in their effect and their orientation. And I think it's time that we, you know, followed the mantra of resilience and looked at our own capabilities and said we've got more than enough ability to handle these types of things through local law enforcement, so long as we keep connected with these parts of the world where these folks are likely to be over the next couple of years. And so the prescription is not to overemphasize or hyperinflate the degree to which Al Qaeda brings together a dangerous, but not a globally catastrophically dangerous Salafi jihadi movement. All right, and to recognize that Al Qaeda's uniqueness historically was its attempt to bring that together, and that made it conspicuously dangerous. Bin Laden's death has dramatically reduced that danger, and our policy, I argue, needs to reflect that going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. Uh, in honor of, of our speakers, I would like to develop uh, some sort of discussion especially because I know that Marine uh, might uh, have to leave for your teaching. Okay, uh, are there any uh, questions uh, now at this point? Please and uh, you have would you kindly uh, come to the mic over there? We've scared them, speechless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you can uh, obviously if uh, the members of the panel want to, to make a statement or ask a question or comment. Somebody, yes, Milton? Milton, I have a very general question. What you've said uh, has to do with the concern over a rise in domestic terrorism and terrorism perhaps is inspired by the ideals of Al-Qaeda uh, even after the death of Bin Laden. What is, what is your view about the importance of a concern over domestic terrorism? One speaker emphasized strongly. What is the panel's concern on that? Um, I, on, on the one hand, I um, what I I've said might seem to minimize the danger from terrorist attacks, but in fact, terrorist attacks are one of the major means that Al Qaeda has used in this war as a whole. So it's one of their major tactics that they've used in this war. So I, I personally do not believe that anything I said should um, minimize uh, the threat that we face um, uh, for potential terrorist attacks. And I'd like to just say about Zawahiri in particular, if he were smart, he would never carry out another attack on the U.S. again. Because unless Americans are dying, apparently we don't care. So if he were smart, he would never, ever, ever attack us again. And keep doing what has been going on in the rest of the world. Um, as one person put it to me, the, the garden spots of the world, this person put it dismissively, um, and um, we wouldn't, we wouldn't intervene. We wouldn't, you know. If he made a public declaration, you know, tomorrow, uh, we've given up. You know, we're not going to attack the U.S. again. I think that that would be <laughs> the, one of the smartest things he could do strategically, um, given his war aims. But I don't believe he'll do it, and that's because I have a slightly different read on Zawahiri than perhaps others on the panels do, um, or on the panel do. Um, 15 years ago, I think that was right on. I think he he had ticked off everybody in his entire organization that he had started. He, he had such an abrasive personality, I think, caused by certain events in his life, most, most especially the fact that he was tortured so horribly and betrayed his best friend, right, to death. So I think there was a lot of pent-up anger that kept him from working well, you know, playing well with the other children. But, on the other hand, he's had 15, 20, you know, nearly 20, to watch how bin Laden did things, to learn from him, to see how the organization works. And I'm sure he has a deputy as well who will take over for him if he is killed. Because the organization is this tightly knit hierarchical organization with lots of room for guys getting pulled off and replacing them. Not that that doesn't cause them problems. I'm certain it does. But a lot of people expected the entire Al Qaeda core to collapse and the whole worldwide thing to collapse after the death of bin Laden, and that didn't happen. There were 40 days of silence because that's the mourning period, 
And then he was announced as the, the next head, and things just went on. Um, but on the other hand, I said that I don't think he'll be able to give up attacking the United States, even though his uh, strategic focus seems to be uh, Egypt and Levant and exploiting the Arab Spring in particular, from you know everything he's saying. But he is also extremely angry at the United States. And I think his attack on the U.S. won't be about chasing the U.S. out of the, you know, our, our lands. It won't be about uh, fundraising, per se. In fact, I don't think it has a rational, it'll have a rational basis at all. I think it'll be pure revenge. Because it was the U.S. that killed his wife and his kids, and I don't think he's ever forgotten that, any more than he's forgotten um, that his, uh, he was tortured by the uh, Egyptian um, uh, government and uh, betrayed his best friend. So, um, I do worry about attacks on the U.S., but I don't see them as having the kind of tight, sort of strategic aims um, that Bin Laden's 9-11 attack, for instance, had that went after economic, um, military, and um, you know, political centers. I believe it'll just, it'll be a, a sort of, um, I want revenge, and he's going to do it regardless, I think, of whether it's, it's to the benefit of the group or not. Yeah, you know, I, I think that Part of that is irrelevant in that um, the, the attacks in the United States could come from Al Qaeda Corps. It could be driven by Al Qaeda Corps. And I do think there's something to be said for the fact that Al Qaeda Corps today has less of a capability to do the spectacular than it once did, though there are still very capable uh, people out there, uh, Shukru Juma and others, people who know the United States, uh, who, uh, who, who are certainly trying to carry out attacks. But the larger thing, to get to the question, which was about the homegrown violence extremist threat, is that the most likely threats we're going to have here in the United States aren't going to come from Al Qaeda Corps. They're not going to be Al Qaeda per se at all, other than from the big idea. I think that operationally, what that means is it's not that we won't have at, at least attempts on spectacular attacks, whether it's from Al Qaeda Corps or Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, the franchises. You'll still have that, but what's much more likely is, and, and likely to be more frequent, is smaller scale attacks by homegrown violent extremists or other wannabes. Some of them may have ties back, as uh, the Times Square bomber did back to Pakistan, and others may not. Um, hopefully, most of those will uh, fail. Well, hopefully, they'll be they'll be they'll be uh, thwarted. If they're not thwarted, and let's be let's call a spade a spade, we didn't thwart the Times Square bombing. It's just that they're not they weren't as capable. They couldn't remember how to make the bombs who would actually you know go off with the right materials, uh, or even the uh, the subway uh, bombing that the, the trial just finished in New York, where they. They had to communicate back one more time because they couldn't figure out how to quite wire it just right. Um, I think that in some ways, um, that's what we're most likely to see. <coughs> so things, I don't take a whole lot of comfort from this. So it may not be an attack that could kill thousands of people, but it could kill, I don't know, hundreds or several dozen. And if you had a bunch of those succeeding, it could be devastating, and it could have devastating economic effects as well. So I think that some of the shifts in how we understand Al Qaeda beyond just the core, that's why I think it's so important to go beyond just debating what is the core today, what might it be tomorrow. It's uh, uh, unbelievably relevant, and, and Thomas think your paper was very, very good. But I think it's, it's beyond that. I think we all agree. It's, it's also now the affiliates, and it's very much the fact that this idea has metastasized, and we don't do a good enough job, neither at the counterterrorism level, counter level, nor at the kind of what the Europeans call the social cohesion level, to deal with this, because homegrown violent extremists tend to be driven by some combination of two things. One, most importantly, I believe, a radical ideology. But what makes them amenable to that radical ideology, what opens them to it, are things that have to do with social cohesion. Again, you know, whether it's you know being underemployed or unemployed or not knowing as a second or third generation Muslim whether they fit am I Muslim or am I American, as we've seen in Europe. Uh, if you look at the Somali American community, you've seen examples of this. There's a lot we can do that's not in the national security realm that would go a very long way towards making the country safer. Can I just offer that? I think there's a tactical implication that both Mary and Matthew touched on that I just, I just want to highlight here. Um, and that is the, the feature of the core in terms of being able to provide this cadre of very capable bomb makers and, and uh, uh, trainers and rehearsers. And Matthew's point about you know the failure of Fazal Shassad in the New York Times to have the bomb go off is indicative of the fact that he was you know a Boy Scout camper in the Fatah. He didn't have a lot of training or a lot of outreach. Oh, the fact so. that Farouk Amoud, you know, couldn't get his underwear to go off in the airplane means that he didn't have a lot of training. Okay? Christine Fair and Dan Byman called these guys, you know, 
tongue-in-cheek referring to them as nitwits, but also 7-7. The difference between 7-7 North London and 7-7, correction, 721 South London was, we believe, the absence of a last-minute visit by a capable bomb maker from Western Plata that caused the bombs to not go off in the South London subway strike that did in the strike in the northern part of uh, London two weeks before. So there is something to a core <coughs> organizational construct, taking something which can either be comical, uh, mildly tragic, into hugely tragic, that we have to be careful to not misunderstand as an important degradation of the core. Now, that doesn't mean that it can't resurface elsewhere. But my point is, if we instead focus on how those pathways exist when you don't have capable training camps and people working with impunity, and how you then look internet and other places to find the disgruntled who suddenly want to change their name to Islam and then the next day show up at a recruiting station with a rifle. Which, by the way, seems to be where most franchisee groups that plot to attack the West want to go right now. They want to go with the weapon, they want to go with the Mumbai-style attack. And I think we need to give our law enforcement some credit for being able to track that and already know where they're headed in that direction. That doesn't mean complacency, but that means those kinds of attacks, I think, to answer your question in another dimension, those are the ones we should fear a little more right now because they require less of this high-tech, high capable high high-ability to get in with a management and a training perspective that Al-Qaeda core brought, but that a lot of these other groups really don't. Um, yeah, well, not exactly only to that, more in terms of, uh, you know, the long-term uh, thing. Uh, I will, uh, uh, first of all, like, if I may say about uh, um, uh, Bin Laden's grave, uh, every single person since the death of the Prophet Muhammad has wanted to have the Islamic Khilafah. Uh, wanting something does not necessarily mean that they can do it. Uh, Hezbollah Tahri wants to have Islamic Khilafah, Jundu Khalifa wants to have Islamic Khilafah, but the, you have to be realistic. You cannot just say that a, a list of desideratum as something of any strategy, and we then say that this is a global insurgency. I'm sorry to say that, no. Uh, because that is only that. That is a list of desideratum. Now, it never is going to happen within the Muslim world. I think, first of all, you have to realize this. History is important. We unfortunately ignore history at our own peril, including recent history. The other thing that is important, we just don't want to see some contradictions in our own policies in the region. We have a relationship with a country that has played us like a fiddle now for 35 years. And that name of that Pakistan is Pakistan. We just don't want to see the facts about Pakistan for a variety of reasons that I don't want to go into that, including the fact that we basically uh, uh, made ourselves a hostage of Pakistan because of our own Afghan policy. I mean, if you have only one route and the other route has to come from Uzbekistan or from God knows that the Russian Turkish in Manas, then you obviously Pakistan is going to do whatever you want to do. I'm sorry to say that. The other thing that of Achilles said that you don't want to understand about the Salafi movement is Saudi Arabia. I'm sorry. Salafism is another word for Wahhabis. This is what it is. And it has started since the 1960s. And as long as we don't understand that, even today, I just gave you this thing that is America published, that the lawyers find that the Saudis can tell by them. And this has been no shut up. These are the nine women victims and things. And then we look for terrorist groups in Latin America that doesn't exist. This is something that we have to say. We are failing American people if we don't realize some of this. So, Khalifat and all this stuff is just that. It's a high dream. The problem is that the Muslim community is never going to be perfect. One of the things that it is dangerous right now and I will go to that, and it is getting more and more dangerous, is the intensification of sectarian and regional conflict. We are making even a country, Turkey, Erdogan is going to pay a heavy price for his ambition. Instead of zero problems, he has no problems with just about everybody. So what I'm saying is that uh, all of those things I agree 100%. And I am no expert on that. We have to follow the Somali disenchanted, the Pakistani, the whoever it is we have to follow. <coughs> at the level of grand strategy, we have to be a little bit honest with ourselves. That how we have been shooting ourselves in the foot. We keep saying that Taliban and Al Qaeda don't have any relationship. Whoever believes in that, we need to prepare. I'm sorry. 
I will shut up. I was invited for that because that's the only thing I can contribute. The regional context. Don't, don't go away. Don't no, go I'm away. not going away, but I give a chance for Mary others. Let's Mary and then go. Just a, one, one point of clarification. Um, you're right. Uh, everybody <coughs> wants to create the caliphate. And this is an aspiration. Exactly. And, well, it's, it's, all these groups, you know, these extremist groups want to create the county. And it's a question of aspirations versus capabilities, right? So the, um, the Hizbut Tahrir is a great example because they attempted to carry out uh, military coups in a lot of different countries and they all failed miserably. Oxford University. Uh, failed miserably, weren't able to do anything. Um, and uh, when I look at Al Qaeda, I see that they have uh, not just that aspiration, but they also are talking about world conquest. Um, well, the, the issue for me is where are they at in actually achieving their objectives? So to me what I see is um, the first objective of overthrowing um, these rulers um, seems to have happened through other means, but there's places like Egypt where Mubarak is no longer in charge, and that was one of the desiderata. But immediately they wanted to set up uh, Sharia in those places, and there they failed. The only places they've been managing to set up Sharia are places like Somalia or Yemen or um, Iraq or northern Pakistan where they've imposed their version of Sharia um, to the everlasting hatred of most of the people in those countries, by the way. Um, and then the creation of these emirates, well, they've declared actually multiple emirates with emirs that are supposedly in charge of these places. I, I believe that the, the, the correct metric for measuring whether they're successful in these areas or not in no has to do... Has to do Ten people created an emirate in a small uh, village in Dagestan. The, 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 to me, the most important metric for saying whether they're succeeding or failing there is, are they controlling people's behavior? Are people in those countries forced to wear the clothing they want them, forced to grow the beard, forced to pray the way they want them to do, you know, forced to give up kite flying and all the other things? The kind of state they want to create is very similar to what the Taliban created in Afghanistan, and there they were really good at controlling people's behavior, despite what most of the people wanted. The other thing I, I would say about this fear, is, fear. absolutely, fear, intimidation, and murder. So absolutely, in Anbar province we saw that, um, you know, on the ground we got to see that for ourselves. Nobody there really wanted these guys, except for some people who had some, you know, revenge fantasies. But anyway, so I guess the important thing is that there's, um, there's what people want and what is imposed on them. And everywhere these guys who have this jihadi salafist kind of ideology have managed to impose their vision, um, and where Al-Qaeda claims that they control these people, um, only with the help of outside actors have we been able to get rid of them once they've set up their so-called emirate. So the people of Chichnya were incapable of, by themselves, kicking out these guys. You had to have um, an outside actor in. The people of Afghanistan were incapable of getting rid of the Taliban, even though they hated their guts. They had to have outside actors to help them. And I see the same thing in Somalia and Yemen, that your outside actors are the only ones who are able to do something. Now, does that mean the United States has to be physically itself involved? No. That is, in fact, not the obvious policy implication of what I'm saying. In fact, that uh, Iraq should have told us that our presence there, in some ways, created more problems than it created help. Our prolonged presence in Afghanistan might have created more problems um, than it helped to solve. So I'm not making an argument for you know, some sort of um, boots on the ground, U.S. must be physically involved in, in all of these places. But there is another thing that we would forget about, uh, about, uh, at our, uh, at our terror, and that is that throughout the 1980s and 90s, we saw uh, Salafi Islam as an antidote to the so-called revolutionary Islam or to communism. This is, this is what it is, because we thought that they are not going to be revolutionary. We thought that these Salafis are just praying and wearing beards and so on and so forth. And now they have metastasized into this system. Even the whole creation of Taliban itself. This was linked to regional rivalries. I'm sorry to say, we have to look at the context. I mean, you don't, you can't start at the issue. The other thing that I, it's a pity there is that you have to have a direct approach to these things. Yes, some people may turn to Taliban, but if the, and I tell you some people may turn to Taliban as a result of going the long civil war that, that you know happened. That if the countries do not 
return to normalcy uh, after about you know 30 years of war immediately and become nice democrats and start uh, uh, doing this. Um, and the same thing in the way that the Salafism has gained influence now even in, in Egypt. A lot of the Salafis are the ones that people who went to Saudi Arabia to work and come and back. Uh, I mean, you know, we have to look at at the root of it, at the source. Um, and this, unfortunately, is the source. And the other thing is that anywhere that state power disintegrates, uh, um, uh, 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 you are going to have all kinds of terrorism. In Yemen, for example, today is Al Qaeda. Tomorrow is going to be something that. But the whole civil war that went on and the external uh, intervention in the civil war. You know, now Al Qaeda's major concern in Yemen is the Houthis. It's very different. It's not uh, so. Belton, one thing to the point of your question, when a tactic is successful, it will be emulated, and we've got a lot of crazies in our country who know how to make a bomb. We don't need help from anybody outside, and we've seen that in some attacks already. It's going to happen more and more. With no influence from anybody from the outside except that it works, unfortunately. Okay, um, next uh, question, please. Identify well, I, yourself. Think the, I take the cue from my question from the good general. Uh, uh, from his talk, and uh, then um, it's expanded by a good deal that was said by the other people. I'm wondering what evidence, that is, what really primary source material exists uh, for any change in game plan, as you pointed out, may well be the case, it is in war, of any change in game plan by Al Qaeda, whether it's game plan as a terrorist group, or whether, as one of our speakers said, it might be a game plan for something beyond just being a terrorist group. Do we have any evidence other than conjecture for any kind of change in game plan? Well, let me, let me just offer that, uh, and, and <coughs> I too am sorry that Mary's left and Matthew would probably be able to add a lot to this as well. Uh, beyond what I can, but but yes, we, we do. We have evidence that Al Qaeda is a thinking uh, and uh, promulgating uh, organization. Uh, it thinks and promulgates through a couple primary media. Uh, one is its uh, its its base website uh, called uh, uh, Al Fajr, uh, and it also has a, uh, a newspaper that promulgates messages and information. And, and predominantly, we get uh, the tone and the tenure of where Al Qaeda's core believes it's headed from the releases and the pronouncements uh, by uh, now Zawahiri himself, uh, or those that are listed in Al-Qaeda as the, uh, the, 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 the heads of internal or external operations for the different uh, functionaries. Uh, so for, for many years, you had uh, one or more of the Libyans uh, promulgating basic doctrine, and uh, you know, Yahya al-Libi, who's since deceased, and Masri al-Libi, who is also since deceased, you know. So they get their time in the air, uh, and then uh, they get their time with the drones, uh, and then, then somebody else steps in. So that's kind of where we, we hear and see. I mean, we, so we've seen the, tact, the tacting change here. We've seen them want to reach out and aspire to what I call co-opt, others call franchise, but to co-opt some of these local level initiative groups. And I would argue to you that that's important in both ways. For the local level groups, it's been important, although we need to watch carefully to see if the importance still resonates after Bin Laden's death. It's important for the same way the common turn was important for people like uh, 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 the, the revolutionaries in Vietnam uh, or the revolutionaries in other parts of the world, because it was a signal for fundraising. Okay, a signal to these very places Shireen's talking about that tend to give the charities, and the charities are under-regulated or over-focused on liberating and more Sharia law, and then those funds and charity information pieces tend to find their way to these groups. And so I think that's an important part of the signaling and the affiliation. But it's also the other way, where the groups announce and, and speculate. Zawahiri does, or one of the Al-Libis, or one of the Al-Masris, who are the other, you know, kind of pronouncers on these different websites, about what it is they expect or want, and how they want to manage the message about Egypt, or about Palestine, or now about Syria. And clearly Zawahiri wants to send the message right now, that Syria is the place for the Mujahideen to congregate. As Sharia has said, he, much more than Bin Laden, because Bin Laden tactically did not want to take on the, um, the Shia until after they dealt with the outside infidels. And the logic here was the Shia are smaller. They are at our beck and call and mercy once we organize 
you know, the Ummah, the faithful on the Sunni side. But now, and this is an interesting tact, okay, Zawahiri, the way I read him, is asking for much more to exploit the sectarian violence against the uh, Alawite uh, in Syria. And that's important, because as Shireen indicates, that does play into another broadening theme in the wider Middle East, which is this Shia-Sunni split, which is anchored on Riyadh and Tehran hostilities over the nuclear weapons, but also over this belief in Riyadh that the last decade has unfairly advantaged Tehran, and that we Americans have helped facilitate some of that by turning Iraq over to the Shia and doing several other things. And so this is all playing out here as well. So this is the interesting tactical shift that we see here. Let me talk about tactics, though. Okay, Tactics don't belie strategy. And here Mary's point applies. To the extent Al-Qaeda matters, it matters for what its overall aspirations are. And if it's not an aspiration for an overall caliphate and an aspiration that says only violence can bring change, then you've not got Al-Qaeda. You've got something that, you know, back in the days of Marx would have been you know, analogous to trade unionists or social democrats, okay? Uh, but, but that takes time. That takes 100 to 150 years to fully develop, you know, through a political process. But if we get to the point where all um, the heads of Al-Qaeda's residual core want to do is talk about how they are influencing the Brotherhood in Parliament in Egypt or they're trying to get a new parliamentary majority in Syria, I think that that ideological battle is just about won, okay? Because then that means the voices of the people speaking through guys who may have been revolutionaries at one time but are now in a political process, that's what's will out, okay? So Al-Qaeda in that analogy is still, to me, the Bolsheviks, all right? And they can't do without the oxygen of violence. So watch them for those, those claims and statements. That's truly where they're trying to find footing because they've lost a lot of footing there in the last decade as people have had alternatives in the greater Middle East and as other voices have arisen. Yeah, Tom, if I could, uh, I think you touched on it a couple times. Um, I think for a game change, you watch, watch the money. It's not about money. It's all about money. It's always about money. Uh, it's what's going to drive them and give them a capability. I think, uh, I think recently, and I can say this in a general sense, I don't have anything to back it up, I think we've realized that, and Matt, from his background in the Treasury, could probably speak to this uh, far better. Uh, we've started to employ those tools to go after some things. And when you take their legs out and add a cord, ideas are important, religious beliefs are important. But if you don't have the capability to do it, you're going to fall flat on your face. And uh, the sooner I think we can leave, we can go down that line and uh, employ gangsters of capitalism in this fight a little bit more. I think the better off we're going to be. Uh, if I may uh, respond, Norton, to you as an academic, I hope you will have an opportunity to look at uh, this uh, book just published. And precisely because of your question, we provided the selected Al-Qaeda electronic political communication persuasion. As you know, uh, the general can defeat an army but the general cannot defeat the mind of the peasant. And this is what we have to deal with. It's both continuity and change. Uh, general Gray, would you like to ask a question or make a comment? Yeah, I, I have, yeah this has all been very interesting. You would have I, uh, to, to use the mic over there. Okay. I'll, I'll use that one. Yes. Oh, this mic. Yeah. It's all been, uh, certainly been very, very interesting and, and most enlightening. Uh, uh, it's always, uh, it's always uh, really good to hear what, uh, what uh, academia and other experts uh, uh, from uh, several disciplines have to say about this topic. I was wondering, though, uh, as I listened to all this, uh, all right, what do we do now? Uh, it seems to me that uh, one thing that was not discussed at all is how do we how do we get the media on board with our intent? Uh, one way, of course, would be to really come up with an intent. <laughs> what do we intend to do in the next uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 years? Take the long view with respect to how do we uh, how do we end up with a better world for everybody? and not just uh, uh, focused on the United States or on Western ideas and all that kind of thing, but how do we, uh, how do we set out to uh, try to improve uh, the world as we know it for, for everybody? That ought to be the kind of goal that, uh, that our country uh, could help take the lead in, 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 
in, uh, in the future, and as I say, 20 or 30 years from now. It's interesting, for example, that we don't seem to really uh, learn an awful lot from history. Uh, one of the things that history teaches us is that really uh, freedom is not necessarily a universal value and all that kind of thing, that many people in the world uh, are more interested in security than they are freedom, and that's why in some cases, in many cases, they gravitate towards a totalitarian type of government and all because they can provide in some ways a better security and the like. And so we need to we need to look at that a little bit and look at our history and see what uh, really can be done to, to make the world better. And I think in terms of terrorism, uh, terms like a global war on terrorism and all that, they're not, that's just not correct. Uh, terrorism is a tactic. It's a tactic tactically and it's a tactic strategically. It always has been and there's been examples as, uh, as you know, not just in the last century, but terrorism and tactics and that kind of thing go back. You can find them in the Koran, you can find it in the Torah, and you certainly can find it in the Bible. And so, and it's a classic way of war. It was phase two uh, of Mao Zedong's philosophy and all that kind of thing. So that's what we're really dealing with are tactics. And uh, the idea that uh, we, we need to try to prevent catastrophic types of tactics from hurting uh, any nation, whether it's our nation or, or any of the free world as we know it today. That ought to be one of our, our primary goals and one of our primary objectives here. We, uh, we forget, for example, that uh, the asymmetric value of terrorist tactics and the asymmetric capability out there, those are the kind of things that present real dangers to us. I uh, also hope that we do not get overconfident here based on what we heard here today. We should never underestimate uh, the enemy or the other people or anything like that. That breeds uh, disaster in the long haul. We want to be very, very careful. For example, the terrorist attack that, uh, the terrorist tactics and the attack that occurred on the 23rd of October of 1983 against uh, the Marine headquarters in Beirut as well as the French headquarters and the Israeli headquarters. Uh, not many people really realize that within a few minutes uh, the, the terrorists took out three major headquarters of three uh, very different countries who were there trying to bring peace and stability in, in Lebanon and the like. And that, uh, that attack was, uh, was uh, really conceived in in Iran, and it was uh, funded with money and material uh, through Damascus and then into the, the Western Front in, in uh, Beirut and carried out by the Hezbollah. And nobody's even mentioned the Hezbollah today, and yet they were a very, very violent uh, uh, group and still are. And in fact, we should have uh, probably gone into them and there in 1983 and gone, and, uh, and gone to the Becca Valley and deposited all of them right there and ended that, but that's a different uh, <laughs> topic. The point I want to make here is that it was a very carefully coordinated attack. One of the things that we, I think we, we over-dramatized is we made a hero out of bin Laden. We aided and abetted everything that bin Laden was trying to do by making him a hero and by, by, uh, by giving them a broad play in the media and elsewhere and the like and almost setting them up as, a, as a somebody that couldn't be uh, taken down and all that kind of thing. Why don't we uh, step back a little bit and, uh, and think about these things a little bit? And I agree uh, with uh, Dr. Lynch that we could do a lot more by, uh, by operating out of this country and out of other countries around the world and like that. We don't have to be in these particular countries and regions to be very, very effective, and not just with uh, special operations type of capability, but there are a whole host of uh, interdisciplinary types of capabilities, political, economic, technology, et cetera, et cetera, that we could bring to bear when we want to do it on our time schedule. In other words, we should drive, we, uh, the free world should drive uh, the whole thing, not, uh, not uh, bin Laden or some other terrorist core activity. I've already said uh, too much here and the like, but I do think that uh, 
I agree. We ought to come up with a, a different kind of a strategy uh, for the long haul, look ahead, and, and, and then work backwards like you would in a campaign plan. You work backwards by phases. You work backwards in terms of what money you can afford to put to this particular strategy and all that kind of thing. Uh, we've got to, uh, and somehow we've got to harmonize uh, uh, not just the academic and research thought and all that and the military thought, but uh, I don't know how you, uh, I don't know how you pull together that crowd across the river. I'll leave that up to uh, some of you academic types. But we really need to, to pull together, and this is above politics and all that kind of thing, and do what's best for, for the free world as we know it today. Thanks. Thank you very much. No, I didn't. I would have let you go first. I thought no, no, Jonas, no. Jonas set us up. Right. I think he did. For those who don't know me, I'm Don Kerr. Uh, I've been associated with a number of organizations over the years. But I think one of the things that came up here that I feel is most important is the need to pay greater attention to Pakistan uh, and be realistic about what it is. Some of you will recall when we got to exploit some of the sites in Afghanistan, what we found was, of course, the evidence at Tarnak Farms and other places of a long-term interest that Al-Qaeda had in other kinds of weapons and other kinds of technology. Not only that, uh, people that supported that effort were, in fact, mostly retirees from the Pakistani nuclear program. If the retirees felt it was important to support al-Qaeda, one might ask whether people currently in the program uh, share those views in, in some manner. It's something I think we need to root out. We also need to understand that when we leave Afghanistan, it once again becomes part of Pakistan's defense in depth against what they consider their real enemy, India. It's healed a bit as a consequence of the Mumbai attack. They talk once in a while now, but uh, in fact, we're a pawn in the game they've been playing uh, in terms of two nuclear-armed neighbors and what each might be able to get from the United States uh, depending on what our interests are in that region. So I think Pakistan is the lurking devil in the background here. It's the place where more technology would be available to Al-Qaeda and those who would emulate them. And it's very poorly controlled. It, it's as close to being a failed state while still remaining a state as any we must deal with. So I just leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Professor Don Bollocks, uh, do you want to make can I sit here? Yeah, you can sit here. Use the mic. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. I'm sort of overwhelmed by how much I've heard. Um, I think I, I'm a civilian and I respect generals. Um, I think General Gray put it well. You know, the title of this program is Al Qaeda, Quo Vadis. And really, the issue is. Of American thinking, quote artists. In other words, a really challenge it is to us. Uh, I have a friend sitting in the back of the room, Nick Rostow, who's a colleague of Mr. Lynch, and he used the term grand strategy, as did Shireen Hunter, as has Brzezinski. I think we have to have a grand strategy. The problem is this is not the cold war. The reference to Lenin, Marx, Comintern, the color, the desire for the caliphate. And by the way, we've had more recently than the Shia. I live in Turkey, so I know that they um, I think we have to somewhat disenthrall ourselves from Cold War thinking. Um, and, and what's interesting is there's so much knowledge. I really was overwhelmed today by all of my neighbors, how much they know. And yet Shereen Hunter said, we don't know enough about countries and their histories. So how do you take this objective requirement, the United States think big, is it? I mean, you know, the Brits talked about the great game. This is, a, is it a great game or is it a lot of little games? And I think that is the nature of the challenge. We have a very good program here uh, on Nigeria, which was referred to before. And it was interesting to listen. You have the local the terrorists, I can't remember the name for something, Haram. And there is some of Al Qaeda there. And of course, there are going to be lone actors there as well. How can we, in our own mind, aggregate 
all these phenomena, just to get a grip on them intellectually, then somehow related to a long-term national grand strategy. I think that is the challenge, and I think as much as we heard today, God knows we heard a lot, I think most of us probably learned more about this subject than ever before, but really, we realize that we don't really know quite how to get our calipers around for this subject. And I think it's a real big I know Shereen Hunter is... Oh, you know, but you just suggest the methodology of somehow looking at this. I, I don't have the answers. I'm not, the, you know, military strategist, and I'm more of a regionalist, but, you know, I have been doing this a lot, and I have maybe the advantage of being from the region myself. The greater. And so I can, I can kind of understand sometimes some of the things. One of the things that I don't think we have come um, the terms with, I don't think in the world generally, uh, is that the collapse of the Soviet Union has just changed the world. Uh, you know, in the old days, when you had a absolutely dominant paradigm, uh, you could have, even though even during the Cold War, I remember one of the books that I read as a graduate student uh, in England, it was uh, called, uh, you know, um, Nations in Alliance. And uh, one of the things is that the great powers generally want alliances in order to achieve their broad gains. Whereas the, the local states want alliances with the great powers to help them in their local little gains. Now, this asymmetry that exists between a great power and the local power has become so much more pronounced and strengthened uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I am sorry to say that I don't think that our, even academic community, but our definitely policy community, at least of what I, I'm sure they know it maybe in their private uh, deliberations, but openly, for example, we don't seem to understand quite well that our interests and Pakistan's interests in Afghanistan are not the same. I wrote an article in 1989 saying that. And the title, if you want to look at Lexis Nexis, was in Afghan. Um, uh, act to America, uh, beware that its interest is not Pakistan. The same thing, our interests in Afghanistan uh, are not the same with Saudi Arabia. Our interests in the Persian Gulf are not the same with Saudi Arabia, or even in Iran. And yet we pursue, both in Afghanistan after our victory, and in Iraq, a strategy that ultimately in, in Afghanistan we favor the Pashtun. Pashtun equals Taliban, to a great extent. Again, in, in, in Iraq, uh, uh, I'm sorry to say, certainly after 2005-2006, we basically helped the Sunni insurgency, and that is a long history of that. So I think this is one of the major things we have to keep in mind, that the whole system of international relations has grown asymmetric. The other thing is that, frankly, I am going to say, this is the last time I'm going to say, but I have an opportunity with important people. <laughs> our policy towards Iran has distorted uh, our entire policy in the Middle East and Central Asia. You cannot go around Iran. We have, whether it was the uh, dual campaign, whether it was to help to create the Taliban, a major rationale behind it was to contain Iran. And we have made of Iran a Soviet, in, that is not a Soviet, you know, it's a crummy little country. You know, <laughs> you know really rickety stuff that has a big mouth, much louder than uh, what they have. So if we want to manage this region, we have to have a holistic approach. And I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, closing word or two, and then I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, First, uh, if I might say it, the legacy, uh, make a comment or two about the potential legacy of uh, Al-Qaeda, if it is dead or dying, and hopefully will fade away, if uh, in the light of who we, the Potomac Institute, are and what we do, we're a science and technology policy think tank where we look at the impacts of science and technology on our society. The impacts in regards to terrorism I'd like to sum up as a final word today's conference. Terrorism, as many have said here today, particularly General Gray, terrorism has been around almost since the beginning of mankind. The ability of a few to terrorize many by killing them publicly has been a tactic that's been used by many, many people. The difference today, and if I might comment that this is to me the legacy of Al-Qaeda, is the demonstration that a small group cannot just terrorize by killing a few but by using technology, kill thousands.
That was the difference of 9-11. It wasn't a terror act where they set off an IED and three or four people were killed, or an IED that brought down uh, a headquarters building and, and 330 were killed, as in, uh, in the Middle East that General Gray commented on. This was an event where a small group used modern technology to kill 3,000 people, and they demonstrated to the rest of the world how a small group of people can have a strategic effect. That's the legacy that we're going to have to deal with and learn how to c compensate and cope with for generations to come. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. We hope that you'll continue to participate with us in this uh, attempt at scholarship and studying these issues, and we hope that you'll once again come back to the Institute of the Future. Thank you very much.